Rowan C from Backcountry Gallery here, and this time around, I want to show you a cool trick for handling a situation where you're too close to an animal and you need a wider crop. This is especially troublesome for prime shooters, but even some zoom shooters can sometimes end up too close. Maybe the animal pops out of nowhere. Maybe it approaches closer than expected. Maybe your safari vehicle just gets too close. It can happen for any number of reasons, but being too close to an animal is almost as frustrating as being too far away, although admittedly not nearly as common. So how do you handle close range shots where you have just too much lens? It's simple. You do an on the fly wildlife panel shot. In this video, we'll look at field techniques and then how to put it all together afterward on the computer and it's actually way easier than you think. The idea is the same as a regular pano shot. You take images of different areas of the scene and then you combine them back home on the computer. Now normally this is reserved for things like landscape and macro work, but if you're quick about it, you can pull it off for wildlife too. I know, you may be skeptical, and I'll admit that it doesn't always work, usually, you know, because the animal moves. But still, I'd rather try it than to forego the shot altogether. First though, a few rules. Obviously, this is going to work better with stationary shots than it will for action work. Not that I haven't pulled an action shot off here and there with it, but it's far easier and far more likely to work with stationary subjects. However, that doesn't mean the subject has to stay completely still either. Things like head turns or small body movements and such usually won't mess you up when they happen between shots. However, if the animal significantly changes body position or moves locations between shots, even just a step or two, you're going to have to start over. You also have to make sure you stay in the same spot as you do this. If you move you know, like side to side or closer or farther from the animal between shots, all bets are off. As for field technique, it's actually pretty simple. First. It's preferable to shoot in full manual mode so the exposure doesn't change as you pan from one part of the scene to the next. However, I also realize these kinds of shots usually are a surprise and if you do happen to be in auto exposure, it's not like the end of the world or anything. As long as you're shooting raw, you can always even out the brightness back on the computer and I'll even show you a trick for that in the second part of this video where we do the post-processing. For the shot itself, I start by focusing on the eye and of course trying to get a good expression. Once I have that, I simply pan left, right, up, down, whatever I need to get the rest of the animal. I normally do this in just two shots, but I have done it with up to six. The trick is that you have to be quick. The second you have that sharp eyeball slash good expression shot, jump to the secondary shot or shots. When you take the second shot or shots, do not refocus. If you refocus, you'll likely end up with sharp and out of focus areas all kind of blending together in a really weird, unnatural way in the final shot. Focus on the eye as much as you want, but for the secondary shots, never touch AF. So if you're using back button AF, simply release the AF on button and then grab your next shot or shots. If you're using shutter release AF though, you'll want to have a button set for AF lock or you know, preferably AE AF lock just in case you're using auto exposure. Although again, it's easy enough to adjust exposure later on in post. You also have to exercise caution when you pan for the next shot. Make sure you're moving straight in the direction of the pan and not going off course. For example, if you're panning down, make sure it's straight down and not like, you know, down into the left or down into the right or something. Otherwise, you'll have a rough time back on the computer when you try to combine the shots. A tripod or monopod really helps here and is the best way to go. However, you can pull it off handheld if you're really careful. I know I have in the past. As for the amount of over overlap between shots. Again, this isn't an exact science since it's kind of done on the fly, so I wouldn't worry about you know absolute precision here. I usually try to have the secondary shots overlapping the first by like you know a third or half. Finally, also consider the overall composition, keeping in mind what the second shot will look like when you pan over to it. In some cases, you may have an animal that looks good in the first shot, but when you pan for the second shot, you realize you're cropping off part of its body. When that happens, people often adjust the second shot's composition to fit the animal. But if you don't pan straight up, down, left or right, and instead go at sort of an angle, you end up missing part of the scene and you're going to need that later on. So it pays to keep an eye out. So that's the field techniques. Let's go to the computer. Let me show you some sample images and we'll put them together. Okay, so here we are in Lightroom and as you can see, we have our first victim ready to be stitched right here. But before we do that, I do wanna emphasize that this is not going to be like a complete course on how to stitch panos. I'm just gonna go over the typical stuff I do for wildlife photography, just kinda of get you started with the basics. So 
Speaking of that, let's go ahead and get started with this little white faced monkey. As you can see, he's kind of hanging over a branch here, which is really, really cute. But unfortunately, I was a little bit too close and I wasn't able to get the whole monkey in one shot. However, I was able to do a pano, so I just kind of panned down and I grabbed his feet and a little bit of space underneath it. And now we're gonna put these two together. It's actually really easy, and by the way, I'm going to show you how to do it obviously here in Lightroom, but keep in mind that most raw processors can do this kind of thing. Photoshop can certainly do this kind of thing, so it's going to be a similar process no matter what you use. So in Lightroom, we're going to go back to the grid view here, and in this case I just have these two images to make it easy, but you need to select the images that you want to stitch. So in this case it's going to be this one here and this one here, so I'm going to hold the Command or Control key down as I click it, and I'll be able to select them both. I'm going to go to the Photo menu, Photo Merge, and just down to panorama. And there we go. We see a little preview there. Very quick, very easy. And there's no obvious errors here, so I could just click merge at this point and be done with it. However, there are a few little options I do want to talk about. First, we have our three projection buttons, spherical, cylindrical, or perspective. Most of the time for wildlife, perspective is the one I end up using. However, I always check the other two just to kind of see if there's any benefit to them. And in most of the cases, there's not. Uh, for this one here, I definitely like perspective a little bit better. But you know, definitely check them out and see if any of these other projections work better for you. Next, we have boundary wrap. And basically what this does is it'll wrap the merge, as it says here, it'll wrap the merge result to fill the rectangular image boundaries, preserving more image content. So basically, if you push it this way, the image gets a little bit bigger. So that's kind of cool. But honestly, the one I like the best here is the fill edges option. So first, before I do that, let me turn off auto crop. This is what we actually have for the stitch. Okay, so when I went down, I actually was not as straight as I should have been. And you can see right here is the top image and underneath it is the bottom image, and you can see how it was merged together there. However, that left some white spaces here. So if we have auto crop turned on, it just crops that away. However, we lose some image content when we do that. So what I do is I turn that off and just click fill edges, and that will fill in those edges for me, and it looks much better. So now we have pretty much a complete image ready to go. And finally, we have the auto settings option right here. This doesn't really have anything to do with the merging process, but this is just basically if you go into the develop module and click auto, it'll auto automatically apply the you know color and tone corrections and things like that. So if I turn it off, you can see it gets a little bit flatter. Now when I click merge, it will output this image as a DNG that we can then go into the develop module and tweak to our liking. So I'm going to click merge. And the nice thing about having that as a DNG is we are preserving the raw data so that we can actually really process this as a raw image once it's all said and done. So that's a big advantage to being able to do the panels inside a Lightroom. And by the way, most of the time this works. I can actually make Lightroom work. I don't have to go into Photoshop as you're going to see here in a moment with our next example. But I'll let that finish up and now uh, fast forward the video for you. Okay, so here we go. We have the final output image here, and then I can go into the develop module and I can tweak this all I want. I can, looks like it could use a little more shadow adjustment, maybe some highlight taming over here, but for the most part, it's pretty much ready to go, and I can just process it the way I normally would, output it, and it's a done deal. However, not all images are quite this easy, and sometimes you have to actually turn to Photoshop. Let me show you that. Okay, next we have this African fish eagle, and I took the liberty of merging them together just to kind of show you how Lightroom did it here. But as you can see, again, way too close on this guy. So let me show you what happened here, though. When I merged them together, if you notice here, we have this weird stick behind him that was going up his back, and then it went over here, and there's this big weird space here. So the vegetation here doesn't quite look right to me. So we're going to use this as an example of how to do a little bit better job than Lightroom does, and we're going to do it in Photoshop. And sometimes, this is a pretty minor problem here, but sometimes I've been in situations where I've tried to merge photos together and it was much more severe than this, but the techniques are all pretty much the same. So let me show you how to do this. So I'm gonna go back here. And our first step is to match the brightness levels and make sure they match. Unfortunately, as I said, sometimes stuff happens by surprise and you wanna be in manual mode, but you happen to be in an auto exposure mode. In this case, I was manual with auto ISO. 
And what happened was I was at ISO 400 here, and then the camera moved it to 720 over here. So this is roughly two thirds of a stop brighter than this one. And we don't want that. We want them to be roughly the same brightness or it's gonna be more difficult to work with in Photoshop. So if you can catch stuff like that here in Lightroom, your best bet is to fix it while you can. So I'm gonna fix this one right now. It's at 720, I'm gonna to go to the develop module. Again, two thirds of a stop. I'm just gonna pull this down to like 0.60 or something like that. There we go. And then go back to the library. And now the brightness levels look much, much closer. It doesn't have to be perfect. And we could, you know, technically you could still tweak this in Photoshop if you had to, but I find it's a little bit easier just to do it here in Lightroom. So as I said, when we were outside, you know, if you do run into a problem with brightness, it's pretty easy to fix if you're shooting raw. So let's open these two up in Photoshop. From Lightroom, I can actually open as layers in Photoshop. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna right click and edit in and then open as layers in Photoshop. So I have them both selected and we'll let it do its thing. Okay, so here we are in Photoshop with our fish eagle. You can see we have our two layers right here. And actually I want this layer, the bottom layer, I actually want on top. So I'm gonna just move that up, just preference on my part. And then I'm gonna turn that back off for just a second so we can see the shot. But the first step here is to give ourselves a little more room to work. So I'm gonna zoom out a little bit and I'm gonna go to the crop tool and I'm just gonna expand the canvas. I have no ratios or anything set in here. If there is something, just hit clear and then you can pull and push this any direction you want. I just need some more space to work with. We'll do a final crop later. There we go. And I'm gonna turn this back on, make sure that layer is selected. And then I'm gonna go to the move tool up here I'm just going to drag that down and there's a couple of ways you can do this. You can drop the opacity and you can kind of put it in see-through mode there and you can kind of line it up that way. But another way to do this, I put that back up there, is to go to difference mode and this works pretty well. I've been using this a little bit more lately. I'm going to zoom in here and tell you how this works. Basically the way difference mode works is when you have pixels that are lining up between images, they go dark on here. So you can see it's you know getting darker the more together these pixels are. And as soon as I have everything as close to black as I can make it, then I know that I have a nice, good lineup of my images. So I'm trying to get that as close as I can. That looks pretty darn good. It doesn't have to be 100% perfect with these because we're gonna smooth that kind of stuff over. Once you have that dialed in, just go back to the blending mode and set it back to normal. And there we go, we have a decent lineup here. Now we just need to smooth out these edges. So our first step here is to drop a layer mask in here. We do that by clicking this little button right here and that'll drop a layer mask. And then we're gonna grab our brush tool right here, make sure we have black as our foreground color and that our opacity is set to 100%. And we're gonna make this brush a little bit larger and we can do that with our bracket keys. I'm gonna use the right hand bracket and I'm gonna make that a little bit bigger because you want a nice soft brush to work with. Also, just a quick side note, I forgot to mention, I noticed it as I was editing the video, make sure that you click this menu and make sure hardness is set to zero. Again, we want a nice soft brush here. So hardness at zero. And then we're just gonna kind of brush along this edge and blend these two together and just kind of merge some of the stuff. You can see how it's all kind of coming together here as I do that. And I'm eliminating the one stalk, as you can see here, and just kind of bringing it down lower so it's not very noticeable. And that looks much better there. So no fancy cloning, no messing around. That was pretty easy to fix. I'm gonna kind of blend this over here a little bit more. Then I'm gonna come over here and blend this area together here. I'm not real worried about this out here. And that's looking pretty good. And I wanna show you something else because we're gonna to have to do something with these feathers too because they should be a line there. You can almost see, you almost have to turn it on and off to see it. But if you look right in this area where my mouse cursor is, as I turn that on and off, you can see there is a little bit of a line. And all we have to do is just bring that nice soft brush in here, maybe not quite that big this time. I'm gonna use a left bracket to make that smaller. And I'm just gonna go gently over that line and just blend these feathers together so it's nice and seamless there. And there we go, that's really all there is to it. I'm gonna look around here, make sure that there's nothing else. Now you can see the bird moved a little bit or I moved because there's kind of a partial opacity thing there. I probably hit it with the other brush. So I'm just gonna brush over this and get a little more detail in there and just kind of bring these guys together so that it's nice and seamless. And that's all you do. That soft brush does all the hard work for you. Just brush along those edges until they're nice and smooth and you can't really see where one image starts and the other one ends. 
So I'm going to zoom back out. And that's looking pretty good so far. Next, I want to get a little bit more space in front of him. And this is a trick I have in another video. If you want to see the details of it, make sure you watch that video. I'll put a card above. But I'm going to give you the crash course right here. So first, I'm going to crop this to about the size that I want. Maybe right about there. I just want that a little, I just want a little more space in front of his head there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a composite layer. I got to start with that. So that means I want to make sure this topmost layer is selected and turned on. And I'm going to hit the Command or Control, Option or Alt button. Again, this all depends if you're a Windows or Mac user. Shift and then the letter E. And that'll make a composite layer of the layers below it. Then I want to take the Rectangular Marquee tool here. And I'm just going to drop down here real close to his beak and just kind of go over this area here. Then I'm going to hit Command or Control T. And that's going to turn on my Transform tool right along that selection. Then I'm just going to drag this like so. And I'm going to stretch this out and give it a double click. And just like that, I've expanded this area and he has a place to look in. This does not work with certain things, but with vegetation, it works real well. Like if you had a pole or something here, obviously that would not work very well. But with vegetation, it works really, really well. And we're going to do it again over here. And again, I'm just going to make sure that rectangular marquee tool is in there. And I'm going to make sure I don't catch any part of the bird here. So i got to be careful of that. I'm probably going to start from the bottom this time. And I'm going to go all the way to that edge. Just kind of go over it a little bit. right? So the selection is right into the blank area there. And once again, hit Command or Control T. And we're going to just drag this this direction. Now you may have to hold Shift down as you do it to make it go straight across like this so it's not acting like this. It depends how you have Photoshop set. But you want it to go straight like that. Double click again. Command or Control D to deselect and there you go and again I go over that slower and in more detail in the other video so if you want to learn that technique definitely check it out but as you can see we now have a final merged image of our fish eagle here that we can finish post-processing to our taste and just put it back in Lightroom or you could just do it here in Photoshop but that's the basic technique and those are the two primary techniques I use as far as merging photos together for wildlife work so there you have it. Again, this technique doesn't always work, but when it does, it can turn a losing situation into a winner. And by the way, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out my educational materials as well. My YouTube videos only represent a very tiny slice of the information in those publications. Each book and video workshop is absolutely loaded with practical, field-proven tips and techniques that will improve your images each and every time you're out. Check them out. I know you'll be glad you did. Also, make sure you sign up for the free email newsletter at my site so you never miss a video, article, or workshop opportunity or you know anything else that I'm doing at the time. Finally, remember to like, subscribe, and get notified. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.